rivers and the sea. Your river runs with love for me, and I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands, for I will always sing of when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love. Sing of your love forever Over the mountains and the sea Your river runs with love for me And I will open up my heart And let the healer set me free I'm happy to be in the truth And I will daily lift my hands For I will always sing of when your love came down I could sing of your love forever. 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 Lord, I want to bless you. sing of your love forever. I will sing of your love forever. I will sing of your love forever. Yeah. You know, Father, again this morning, Lord, we're so looking forward to that day. That day, Lord, when in a moment and in the twinkling of an eye, Lord, this corruption will put on incorruption. And this mortal would put on immortality and we would be caught up to meet you, Father, in the air. And so shall we be with the Lord forever. You told us to comfort one another with those words. And we do, Lord. We are comforted with those words. But Lord, I'm looking forward to that moment when I'm going to be able to worship you face to face in a new body eyeball to eyeball and so Lord as we long for that moment may we be in preparation we know we're living in the last days we know time is short help us to be about your business Father and so again this morning we would just ask that your Holy Spirit would be here that it would be dealing with the issues of our hearts of our lives Whatever might be going on, Lord, we want to give this time to you, Father. We want to worship you with all of our heart. We want to study your word to be conformed to the image of your son, the Lord Jesus. And so, Father, work in our midst this morning, we would pray and we would ask in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's kids would say, amen. Amen. Hey, let's remain standing this morning. to the fountain. 
waves of his mercy as deep cries out to thee we sing come Lord Jesus come come Lord Jesus come all who are thirsty all who are thirsty fountain, dip your heart in the stream of life, let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of his mercy, as he cries out. to be here with us. You say you inhabit the praises of your people, Lord. May you be our guest of honor. The, the, we're, we're certainly not here to just sing songs. We are here to worship you, to be with you, Lord. So may your spirit fall upon us. But also, Lord, not only we sing that you'd be here with us now, but Lord, like in Revelation, even so come quickly, Lord. Our world it's just getting more and more dark and evil. You know, Lord, that scripture where it says the love of many will wax cold in the end days. I, and I think a lot of times we read that and just thought, oh, well, people will be a little bit grumpier or something like that. But we, what we're seeing is where it just is just violence, constant violence like it was in the days of Noah days of judges and Lord even so Lord come quickly can't wait for that moment where we hear that sound and we are with you together never to be apart again but until then Lord may we shine for you Down to the 
This is love. This is love. He walked the hill. He bore the cross. This is love. This is love. I bow down to the to think that in that moment on the cross those years ago you demonstrated the love of God you demonstrated that you are in love with us and yet you go beyond that you you love us here and now and Lord you will love us for all eternity Father, we just we just want to give you our whole heart. We lay our lives down at your feet in submission to you and your Holy Spirit, to your word.
steadfast love, your steadfast love, your steadfast love overcomes. When troubles rise, you lift our eyes, your steadfast love. It's, you are the one thing that is steadfast in this universe. You never change. And that's why our faith in you, Lord, is solid as a rock. Lord, our lives, no matter what may come, we are on that solid foundation because it's on you and you are in never ends your mercy never ends thank you Lord let's all stand
You know, again this morning, just to contemplate that thought, to understand to the full that theology, that great doctrine of justification, to know again this morning that, Lord, not by any meritorious act of our own, not by any deed, not by any action, not by any work, not by any goodness, Lord, that we possess. But our great salvation, and it is great, it came to us as a gift from God Almighty through His Son, Jesus Christ, as we responded to that work of Your Spirit through faith. Lord, we thank You for that. And Lord, having received that gift, you say the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. You're not going to take it back. We thank you for that this morning, that we are possessors of eternal life, that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And Lord, we have this blessed hope, the hope that one day, I think very soon, I'm hoping very soon, that you will come and take us out of this cesspool. You know, Lord, as we just saw this last couple days, the shooting in El Paso, Texas, 20 dead, 26 wounded, then to find out again this morning, Lord, in Ohio, another shooting. The absolute vile wickedness of human hearts. The problem's not guns. The problem is the heart of man. And the love of many, as Pastor Todd said, waxing cold, Lord. It's, it's all around us. We're living in the last days. We see it. But, Lord, it's just stirring our hearts. It's just stirring our hearts this morning that we want to go home. I'm just so tired of this place. Because it's not my home, you know. It's not even a vacation anymore, Lord. It's just, I'm just sitting here wondering, Lord, when? When are you going to come and get us out, man? It's starting to stink around here, Lord. You can come at any moment. We're ready. And so we lift that to you this morning, those situations. Pray for those that are squeezing in the last bit of summer on vacation, Father. Give them traveling mercies. Be with my wife in Wyoming, Lord, as she makes her way home tomorrow with Chris Inns. And, and Lord, just have blessed their time. Be with my son-in-law, Ben, and his wife as they're in Colorado, Lord, at one of the shows where he promotes his business. Lord, be with them as they're on their way home. And Lord, just with all the others, you know, school starts again in a couple of weeks. Father, I want to pray for our fair this week. I, uh, this week. I want to pray, Lord, that nothing weird happens there. That you just keep everybody safe. And Lord, we just again pray for our finances, for our emotions, for spiritual warfare, for physical needs. Several was introduced to me this morning, physical needs, Lord. I want to pray for those. I want to pray for Warren Smith's eyes, Father. There's some problems going on there. We, we lift Warren before you this morning, Lord. And you know what? We would ask that you could give the doctor wisdom, but more than that, Lord, we'd ask that you'd just take care of it, that you'd just heal his eyes, Lord. He needs his eyes to write and do the ministry you've called him to, Lord. And we just ask that you would, you would, you would minister mightily to him and to his wife, Joy, and just bless them lord we pray this morning and so lord we just lift all of these things to you knowing that you're going to take care of all of it every bit of it and we do so in jesus name and all god's kids would say amen amen, amen. well hey you know the drill spend a little time fellowshipping before you settle into your spot this morning hey let's turn to romans chapter 14 we came as far as verse 19 that's where we'll pick up this morning and as you're turning there let's pray Father, we thank you so much for your word. You know, we've come to that practical section of Romans where it just talks to us and teaches us, Paul does, the Apostle Paul does, about how we ought to be living and interacting with one another. And so, Lord, as we, we look at these things, very important, because we can fall into the very traps that he's warning us about. You know, anytime the Bible speaks against something and challenges us, towards something it's because it knows we'll have a struggle with that something we always do and so lord as we look at these things this morning about not judging another man's servant on the things that aren't clearly described in the bible but just allowing the holy spirit to do its work in each of our lives um as we look at these things, Lord, may that soak in, may that sink in, Lord, we pray. And we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus. And again, all God's kids would say, Amen. Amen. You know, I'm, I'm getting a little sad because I know that we're getting close to the end of the book of Romans. And again, it's one of my favorite books 
of the New Testament, truly it should have been labeled the gospel according to the Apostle Paul. It, it really is the fifth gospel in the Bible. I love how Paul, in a very masterful way, walks us through the first eight chapters, takes us from condemnation, because every one of us were conceived in sin, we were born in transgression. We enter this world under the condemnation of God. But God has provided through His Son a way that we might be justified apart from our works. So He moves us from condemnation to justification. And after we come to that understanding, that great theological understanding, that we are justified by faith, not by works, we're His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, then He moves us into sanctification, learning how to walk as we profess to know Christ and walk like Christ, that sanctification. Then He tells us that during that walk, as we have struggles, we're preserved in Christ, And that's a good thing, amen, that you're preserved in Christ. And then he proved that in chapter 9, 10, and 11 as he's talking about the covenant with Israel, that God is a covenant-keeping God. When we came to chapter 12, he enters now a different section. Past the doctrinal section, now we're in that section where he talks about practical Christian living. Now that we're born again, now that we're filled with the Spirit of God, now that we're justified by faith, now that we become sons and daughters of the living God, our names are written in the Lamb's book of life, how do we live out our Christian faith? How how do we experience our Christian faith? What should it look like? And he begins by saying the first thing it should look like is that we should present our bodies. That's always going to be the struggle. As living sacrifices holy and acceptable unto the Lord because it is our reasonable service. Now that we're saved, we should be presenting our bodies, the way we think, the way we act, places we go, how we dress. We should be presenting our bodies, you know, what we digest, the things we take into our life, things through our ear gates, eye gates, those things we should be presenting to Him as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto the Lord because it's our reasonable service. And then he says, stop being conformed to this world. Do you know this world is constantly trying to put us into its mold? You know, to speak politically correct. Do you know that new hate speech is truth? And, you know, man, shame on you if you were ever to speak the truth in public someplace. Or if you wore a red hat that that had a logo on it, like, make America great again. You might, (laughs) you know, we're living in a time where truth is not such a popular thing. But we are not to be conformed to this world. In fact, in the Greek it says stop being conformed to this world. Stop allowing the world to force you into its mold. But be ye transformed, metamorpho in the Greek, to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And we renew our mind as we're in the Word of God. That's why we study through the Bible. That you might be able to prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of the father now we need to grow in grace and grow in our faith that's what he's talking about and so he's talking about a life separated unto the lord a life of holiness a life of consecration a life of dedication in chapter 12 chapter 13 a life that is submitted to the authority that's over it chapter 14 how not to judge now how many have ever had a problem judging somebody just just me Now again, as we come to the rest of this chapter, and we're going to get into the first part of chapter 15 this morning, listen carefully. Paul is not talking about the essentials of the faith. There are things that God clearly calls sin. And we are called, if we see a brother, read in Galatians, if we see a brother, chapter 6, caught up in a sin, we are to go to that brother, considering ourselves first, not in a judgmental way, but considering ourselves first, to restore such a one back to the faith. If I see you walking into a bar on Friday night as I'm passing by, driving up the road, and there's a bar there, and I, you know what, I'm going to happen to you on Sunday, I'm going to come to you and say, brother, what are you doing? Well, I was just delivering, you know, I work for a delivery. Okay, well, fine. But no, I was in there witnessing, really. (laughs) Seriously? Let's talk about that for a little bit. Let's see what the Scripture says about it. You know, I'm to come to you in in an attitude of humility because I care about you. I care about your faith. I care about your walk. 
I care about your relationship with the Lord. I care about your reputation. I care about you. I'm not coming with some judgmental attitude and as though I were Moses coming down from the mount with the Ten Commandments in my hand. No, no, no. I'm a sinner saved by grace just like you. It's just one beggar showing another beggar where the bread's at. But I'm here to tell you that there are things that you can allow in your life that will be harmful to you and to your faith. And if I love you, I'm going to speak the truth to you in love. I'm going to warn you. I'm going to hold you accountable as you would hold me accountable because we care about each other. So when he talks about sin, we are to confront in a way of humility one to another. And the idea is to restore it is to warn, it is to help, it's to come alongside and to lift up and to undergird, you know, those brothers who may be slipping and stumbling and falling. Would you say amen? We have a right to do that. We have a responsibility to do that. And we need to do it in such a way that we don't come off as being superior because we're not. We all struggle in many things. Would you say amen? But we want to help each other. That's what we're, we're called to do. But the thing he's talking about here is judging somebody for a particular preference that the Bible has nothing to say about. You know? And he's going to use three things. He's going to use food, drink, and days. You know, because as we saw last week, at the birth of the church, you had all of these different culture and people groups coming together. You had Jews and Gentiles. You had Greeks you had sin and poverty. You had all of these people coming together now to faith in Christ. And a, a many different cultural preferences were involved as this church is being birthed. And some were beginning to judge one another. You know, remember what Peter said when the sheet was let down and the Lord told Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything unclean. And so the Jews had a very strict, you know, dietary law given to them in the Old Testament. And here comes Gentiles saying, pass the pork chops. Man, I'll have one of those ribeyes. You know, you know, what is that, escargot? Well, I'll eat it. Whatever it is, if it moves and I can kill it and cook it, I'll eat it. The Gentiles coming in, and now all of a sudden there's this riff in the body of Christ because you have Jews keeping a very strict dietary law, and you have Gentiles saying, God said if it, if, if it, if it moves and I can get it, I can eat it. And that's how they were living. And it was causing a division. Not over doctrine, but over preference. Then he's going to talk about drink. You know, under the Nazarite vow, and one of the things when you were totally consecrated to the Lord in the Jewish mindset was, you had let nothing of the vine touch your lips. No wine. And yet, the Gentiles in moderation, not in drunkenness, because drunkenness is a sin, would drink wine. In fact, Paul has to write and tell Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach's sake and your off-time infirmities. Red wine has 36 different things that are all good for you. But some were saying you shouldn't drink at all. Some were saying you can only drink a little bit in moderation. And then others were getting drunk, and they had to confront that. And so all of this confusion and judgment that was coming in to the body of Christ. Because the Jews felt like if you were really consecrated to the Lord, you wouldn't let that stuff touch your lips. I had a guy come to me one time and said, you know what, Jesus is our example and he drank wine, so I should be able to drink wine. I said, that's a good point you make. Because Jesus said he wouldn't drink of the cup of the wine until he does it with us in glory. Now when I get in glory and God pours me a cup of wine, I'll drink it. But until I get in glory, I'm not going to do it. Because the Bible says for me as a pastor not to have any. It says the deacons can have a little bit. And listen, but we're living in a society today where that can be a problem. Would you say amen? And I'm seeing today drinking becoming very popular in the church today when it shouldn't. We're going to see why this morning as we walk through the text. But drink and then days. The Jews said, well, the proper day of the worship is Saturday. Saturday is the Sabbath. And, and now the, the church, the Gentiles coming in and said, no, no, we should worship on the day that jo Jesus rose from the dead. We should worship on Sunday. Controversy, not doctrine, not scripture, preference. And so as we looked at last week, we saw there in verse 4, he says, who art thou 
that judges another man's servant. Be careful when you fall into this judgmental attitude. We were just talking in the prayer room before I came down that there's things that, that I don't like, I, I don't think are right. I can't prove them in Scripture. They're my convictions. I can't do those things, but I wouldn't put my trip on you. I wouldn't do it. Because if I can't back it up with the Word, I have to leave it alone. I have to trust the Holy Spirit working in your life. Amen? It says, Who art thou who judges another man's servant? Because before his master he stands or he falls. Yea, he is able to hold him up. God is able to make him to stand. You know, on these peripheral areas, you just have to give room for the Holy Spirit to work. And that's where we're at this morning. We're talking about not judging one another for different preferences that the Bible's not clear on. Amen? You know, there's a lot of things that can go on and divide. There's things in the church that divide us that need to divide us when it comes to doctrine. What we believe about what Jesus taught what we believe about the Scripture and the errancy of Scripture, there are things that I will divide over. There are things that will break my fellowship with somebody else, and, if, and, and, there, and there are very few. The inerrancy of Scripture is one of them. The deity of Christ is another. Salvation by grace, certainly. The atoning work on Christ's cross, that He was God incarnate, that He was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died a substitutionary death on Calvary's cross, rose again the third day, the resurrection, and salvation by grace. If you don't believe those fundamental things, then we can't have fellowship. Because unless two agree, they can't walk together. On the major Bible doctrines, those things that are essential to the faith, if somebody disagrees with the essentials, I can't have fellowship with them. But on the peripheral areas, whether you think it's okay to smoke a cigar or get a tattoo or to have a glass of wine, not drunkenness, I'm not going to break fellowship over that with you. I won't even break fellowship over you when you think Jesus is coming back. And a lot of people have broken fellowship over that. You know, if, if you want to have it right, if you want to be right, you are pre-trib. You believe Jesus is coming back before the tribulation. But if you want to be wrong, you can say, you know, post-trib, mid-trib. And listen, I got a scripture for you. I'm not going to break fellowship over that, you know, with you. Hey, we'll pick you up on the way back. As your faith is, so be it unto you. If you want to go through it, go through it. I'm going to be eating supper with Dad in heaven. I won't break fellowship with you over that. Whether you believe you can speak in tongues or not today, whether the gifts of the Holy Spirit are for today, I won't break fellowship over that with you. Sad for you to eat cake without icing. I like the icing, man. Give me all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I need them. Amen? But I won't break fellowship over you for those reasons. And I certainly won't break fellowship over the peripheral things. And that's what he's saying. Watch as we come now to verse 10. Actually, let's back up to verse 9. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be the Lord both of the living and of the dead. The statement is that God is the Lord. That's what we should all arrive to. He's our Lord. He's the Lord of the living and he will be our Lord when we step out of this life into eternity. Amen? That's the goal. Is Jesus Christ your Lord? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the second person of the Godhead of the Trinity? Do you believe that He took on human form for the sole purpose to die for the sins of the world, to become that sacrificial lamb? Do you believe that he was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died a substitutionary death, rose again the third day, ascended to make intercession for us before the Father, and that we are saved by grace through faith? If you believe that, and he is your Lord, he's the Lord of the living, and he'll be your Lord when you step out of this life. Why does that matter? Because if He's your Lord and you're born again, then the Holy Spirit is cooking in you. If you are born again, you will love His Word. But Jesus said, 
all my sheep hear my voice and they follow no other. There's an affinity, there's a love for his word. There's a love for the work of the spirit in our heart. There's a love for that intimacy we have with the father. And we have to allow, is what Paul is saying, for the Holy Spirit to work in our brothers and sisters as he's working in us. Will the Holy Spirit convict of sin? The Bible says it will. Jesus said, I, when I go away, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'll send you another comforter. And when he comes, he will lead and guide you into all truth. He's our guide, is he not? He makes the scriptures, when we read them, become clear to us. He's our instructor. He leads and guides us into all truth. He will convict the world of sin. Does he convict you of sin? How many were convicted this week? Man, I want to tell you, I had to go down to Auburn to get some paint. I'm doing some stuff around my house. I'm so convicted on the way down. You don't go to Auburn at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm going to tell you right now, just don't do it. You know, I'm still in road rage. Although I'm, I'm able to control the physical part of it, but I'm raging inside. If those people knew who I were, they would not pull out in front of me like that. <laughs> Pride just stirred up in me, man. I'm going to tell you, I'm repentant. Convict us of sin? Of, <laughs> yeah, I see some of you guys laughing. Convict us of sin? Of righteousness that we should be living right before man, right before God, and of the judgment that is to come. The Holy Spirit does that. Listen, you're not the Holy Spirit, and I'm not the Holy Spirit. Amen? We're helpers in each other's faith. We come alongside to encourage and uplift. And if we see a brother, like we just said, caught up in a sin, we go to that brother, we go to that sister with an with a attitude of humility and meekness because we want the best for that person, not to judge them, but to help them, to encourage them, to reason with the Scriptures with them and say, what are you doing? What are you thinking? Really? Is that the best thing for you, for your walk with the Lord? Does that promote your walk? Listen, you ought to reconsider that. Let's, let's do a little Bible study on that. Let's look at God's Word. But so many churches are divided over stupid things. So many Christians break fellowship over things they should never break fellowship over. Amen? That's why he says in verse... 10. Listen carefully. Now we start our study. That was just introduction. But why does thou judge thy brother? Why do you? Why do I? Why do we? Or why does thou set at not thy brother? Why do you break fellowship with your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying, why are you judging somebody? Why are you breaking fellowship with somebody and setting your brother at naught over things that don't really matter? Now, we're, again, we're not talking about doctrinal issues. The Bible's clear on sin, and the Bible says, you know, if you see a brother that's committing fornication or adultery or sexual immorality or drunkenness, whatever, you see a brother that's caught up in that, the Bible says that we're not to have fellowship with them. Go to them, warn them, but if they reject that, we're not to have fellowship with them. Now, if you have friends in the world that are doing that kind of thing, it says, listen, you, you, you need to be a witness to them, but else you would have to go out of this world not to, to rub shoulders with fornicators and adulterers, but one who calls himself a believer in Christ. Listen, if they're going to live that lifestyle, you, you can't live it with them. You have to be that salt and light toward them. You can't live it with them. But there are many things that he says that we can, break, judge, uh, we can judge and break fellowship over that we shouldn't. Why do you do that, he says. Then he says this, for it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. What he's saying is there is a judge and one day that judge will judge the motives of our hearts, our actions. Now, I, I want to draw your attention to something because it's very important because I think this can become confusing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 
beginning in verse 11, and we're just going to read through verse 15. They'll put it up on the screen for you if you don't want to turn there real quickly. Leave your finger at least in Romans chapter 14 while you do. It says this, For other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. How many this morning are saved? How many know that you're standing on the rock? You've been placed firm on this foundation of truth. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 on through about 22, it says we are, we, are, we are built upon a foundation of the apostles, that's the New Testament, prophets, that's the Old Testament, Jesus Christ, the Gospels. You know, we're built upon that foundation and we are growing into this building for the habitation of God by His Spirit. So we have come to faith. We've been put on a foundation. Now watch what he says about this foundation. Now if any man build upon this foundation. Now we've been given a foundation. It was a gift. We've been placed upon it. That was a gift. Now we begin to build our lives on this foundation. This foundation of truth. And he says, if any man builds upon this foundation gold. Now here are the building uh, you know, products and supplies that we have. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. So those are, the, those are the materials given in this life to build upon this foundation. And then he says this, If any man's work abides, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive, notice very carefully the next two words. What are the next two words? A reward. This has nothing to do with your salvation. In fact, he's going to tell us in the text it doesn't. You and I one day are going to stand, listen carefully, at the Bema Seat Judgment of Christ. We will never stand at the Great White Throne. The Great White Throne Judgment is reserved at the end of the Tribulation period for those that are resurrected and stand be before God for their sin. You and I, our sin has already been dealt with. Our sins have already been dealt with through the blood of Jesus Christ. You and I will never, as believers in Jesus Christ, ever stand before God and give an answer for our sin. Jesus has already stood before God and answered for our sin. That's why he says, by one sacrifice he has perfected forever those that he made holy. And your sins and my sins, our sins, he remembers no more. They're under the blood. This is not a sin issue. This is not a salvation issue he's talking about here. This is how you live your life after you're saved. The Bible makes it very clear. We're going to give an account to God for how we live out this life. And he says, I'm going to give you this currency. And everybody has currency. You have time. You have energy. You have talent. You have resources. Everything that this life is about is currency that God has given you. And how you spend that currency, how you spend your time, your energy, your talents, how, how, you, how you act and how you behave, how, how you interact with other people is your life currency. And one day when you stand before God at that bema seat judgment, listen, you are going to have to give an account to God how you lived out the life that he gave you as a believer. And so he says, these are the materials given. If any man work abides, because listen, he says back up here, every man's work shall be made manifest. That's sobering, isn't it? Because he's going to walk us through this judgmental attitude. He's going to walk us through the things that we call liberties that can hurt other people, and we don't care. Listen, the motive of our heart one day we'll be judged by God at the Bema Seat. The actions, how we interacted, how we either helped or hurt other people, those things are going to be judged. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work to see what sort it is. If it is of the flesh, it's going to be burned away. If it's of the Spirit, it will remain. If it's of the flesh, it's the wood, hay, and stubble. If it's of the Spirit, it's the gold and silver and precious jewels. 
And the idea is you're going to be rewarded by what's left over. And then he says this, If any man's work abide, which he's built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Not salvation, it's a reward. And if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet as by fire. We're all going to stand before God and give an account. You know, one of the scary verses in the Bible says, "By with what measure you judge others, you yourself will be judged. You know, there's two kind of people that show up at the scene of an accident. If you leave church today and you're flying down Highway 20, somebody pulls out in front of you and you T-bone them. Two kind of people are going to show up to that accident. The first, the police will show up. Red lights flashing, sirens wailing. And when they get there, their job is to find out who was wrong. Their job is to find out what caused the accident and who goes to jail. The second group of people show up and they got lights flashing and sirens blaring too, but they don't care who caused the accident. They don't care who's at fault. They don't want to take anybody to jail. What they want to do is find those people that are hurting and get them on a gurney and get them in an ambulance and get them to a hospital. Those people are called paramedics. You need to choose today whether you want to be a cop or you want to be a paramedic. You want to choose today whether you want to help people or judge people. You need to choose today are you going to assist or are you going to resist? And one day when you stand before God, because the greatest paramedic ever was Jesus Christ. The woman caught in the very act of adultery, drugged through the street, streets in shame. You know, I got questions about that whole thing when I get to heaven. Number one is, how did they catch her in the act? Were they peeping toms? You know, you know, quieting minds, you didn't know these things. And as far as I know, doesn't it take two to commit adultery? Where's the guy? They just drag the woman through the streets. They throw her at the feet of Jesus, and then they ask a question. These Pharisees do, what saith the law? Well, they knew what the law said. That's a rhetorical question. They knew the law demanded that she be stoned to death. That's the police. How many of you ever thought, man, I hope that guy gets smoked. I hope fire comes down from heaven and gets them. Man, they need to be got. How many ever thought that? Be careful. You're a cop. John got in trouble doing that, didn't he? Remember when he's coming through Samaria and they wouldn't find a place for Jesus to lodge? He said, Lord, let's just call fire down from heaven and smoke them. Well, that sounds like Jesus to me. Call fire and smoke them. You know what's hilarious about that whole thing? Is John did get to call fire down from heaven on Samaria. But it was the fire of the Holy Spirit. You remember when Philip's down there preaching in Samaria and the whole place is getting saved and they send news to the church in Jerusalem and they send Peter and John down and when they get down there, they're praying that people will be filled with the fire from heaven. Not the judgmental fire, but the fire that aids, that supports, that convicts, that instructs, that, that again, leads and guides and teaches. Be careful what fire you want to call down. Amen. 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 Because when you want to call fire down, you're just being a cop. But Jesus came and said to that woman, but before he says anything to her, he bends down and he begins to write in the sand, I think they're sins. What were you doing in the bar last night, Pharisee number one? What was that you were watching on your computer, Pharisee number two? Who is Becky? Because that's not your wife's name, Pharisee number three. I hope there's no Beckys in here. I tried to pick a name that there was nobody. I didn't know any Beckys. 
starts writing these things down, and one by one they peel off. Why? Because it exposes their hypocrisy. Listen, be careful when you think that you have arrived to a place to judge another person. That's what Paul is saying. We all one day will stand before the judge. And every knee will bow on that day, and the hearts of men and the motives will be revealed. Your sins be forgiven, but your deeds are going to come before the Lord, those things you've done that weren't right, that weren't of the heart of the Father. Because when you're judging somebody else, you're actually judging yourself. But no matter you judge, you will be judged. When you got one finger pointing at somebody else, you got three pointing back at you, and the only thing that's doing anything right in that is the thumb because it's pointing toward the Lord. Do this and stop doing that. Amen? I just made that up. That was pretty cool, huh? <laughs> just came to me. Just came to me. This is what he's talking about. Who are you to judge another man's servant? Before his Lord, he stands and falls, and the Lord is able to hold him up and to make him to stand. Why do you judge your brother on non-essential things? Why do you set it not your brother over stupid stuff? That's my paraphrase of Paul. We're all going to stand before God one day, and we're going to give an account. Not for our sins, because they're dealt with. But for how we acted as believers, how we interacted with one another as believers in this life. Do you know every word spoken is going to come to judgment? Do you understand that? So when you criticize, when you accuse, when you slander somebody else with your tongue, you are doing the very ministry of Satan who is the accuser of the brother. And one day you'll stand before God and you'll give an account for those very words. God's going to say to you, man, what were you thinking? I forgave you of so much and you couldn't forgive of so little. I defended you and you criticized that other person. I showed you grace and mercy. I was patient and long-suffering with you i was kind and i was faithful to you when you weren't even faithful to me and you couldn't go and do likewise to somebody else you knew me here but you didn't know me here because i love even the sinner and i hope the best for the saints this is what Paul is saying. Man, we are not getting done with verse chapter 14, are we? <laughs> verse 12, it's going to get rough here. Watch this. So then, every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. And when I get there, I want to be able to say, I, I struggle with this, but I want to be able to say, Lord, I have been gracious and merciful to others as you have been gracious and merciful to me. I have been as forgiving to others as you have been forgiving to me. I have been as patient. And here's where I'm struggling with. You know, the loving part, I, I've got but the patience. Lord, I have been as patient with others as you have been patient to me. Let me ask you something. We're not going to get there today, but as he closes out this chapter, he mentions the God of all patience, the God of all comfort, and the God of all hope. He mentions three great attributes that God has. The God of all patience. Are you patient with others as God has been with you? Don't raise your hand. The God of all comfort. Have you comforted others the same way God has comforted you? Do you build hope in others the same way God has built hope in you? You see, that's the goal. That's the end game. That's, that's when we arrive. That's where we're headed. That's our destiny. That's what God wants to form in us. May Christ be formed in us because that's who he is you see. He doesn't judge. 
He judges when he does righteously, and he does it to convict that he might bring us into restoration. Listen carefully what it says in verse 13. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I like that. Now Paul's going to move past the food, past the drink, past the days, because we can get all divided over that. Whether somebody smokes a guitar, gets a tattoo, or you know, if you're vegan, vegetarian, or a carnivore. You know, the herbivores don't need to get in a fight with the carnivores in the church. Amen? We don't need to do that. That's, that's not wise. Amen? This is what he's going to say here. Now watch. But if you're going to judge something, here's what you ought to judge. You ought to live your life in such a way as you live for other people. And you never cause an occasion for somebody else to fall. Now you may be here saying, hey, listen, I've got the liberty to drink a glass of wine. I've got the liberty to have a beer when I get off work. You may have that liberty. But if it costs somebody else their salvation because they are weak and you entice them in their weakness to become a drunkard again or a drug abuser again, then you have sinned against Christ. That's the point he's going to go to. If you want to judge anything, judge yourself. Judge how carefully you walk in respect to other people. Put their needs above your own. Let this mind be in you that was found in Christ Jesus when he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He humbled himself and became of no reputation. Found in the form of a man, he became a servant. And found in the form of a servant, he became obedient to the death of the cross. Let that mind be in you. You may be here this morning and thinking that, hey, I have the liberty to, to eat meat. And you invite one of our brothers or sisters over as a vegetarian. You better cook vegetables. Or if you think it's, and I personally, it's my conviction that Christians should not be drinking today at all. And I have a reason for it. Because it's epidemic in our world. You, you should sit in my office and listen to how many women have come in and been abused by alcoholic husbands. How many children have been abused because of alcohol. How, the stats of how many people are killed on the streets because of alcohol. Marna's research says one in 14 people that taste alcohol for the first time will become an alcoholic. It's just not worth it. Raspberry iced tea. Man, that's so refreshing. I will tell you to this day, one of the things that I remember 40, almost 45 years ago when I got saved is after a hard and hot day at work to have a nice cold beer. I enjoyed it. There are days where after the end of a very long and hot day, I think about it. But then I think, what if somebody were to come and visit me at my house at the end of the day? Or what if at the end of the day I just take a shower, have a cold beer, and I get called to go to the hospital? And there I have alcohol in my breath. I'm going to set that thing aside. I personally believe the pastors, senior pastors, should drink no alcohol, period. I think the Bible's clear on that. I think the Bible's very clear on board members and deacons can have some. But I think for the cause of Christ, I don't want any. I wouldn't do anything to stumble you guys. I just don't want to. I don't want you to be emboldened to take to excess what I may allow in my life in moderation. Because I care about you. I care enough about you that I would lay that down. In fact, I care enough about you that if, and I jest about this, but if meat would offend you and I've invited you to my house, I would not be cooking steak. We'd be having vegetables because I wouldn't stumble you. This is what Paul is saying. Listen carefully. Let us not therefore, let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this, rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded, Paul would say, by the Lord Jesus Christ, that there is nothing 
nothing unclean in itself. Now he's talking about food and drink and all of these things. Nothing is unclean in itself. Uh, nothing is unclean. Everything is pretty much neutral. Food, drink, the day. There's nothing in, unclean about it, but what you do with it can make it unclean. Listen carefully. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. You know, there are people in churches today that think playing canasta is a sin, playing cards. Did you know that? No, they do. I would never invite them over my house and break out a deck of cards. I, I grew up in a church where there were people in that church because Colin and I played Uno. When we, we first got you know, married, we didn't have a lot of money, so we bought a bunch of board games. We bought Uno, and, and we'd, we'd invite some of the other young couples over, and we'd play board games in Uno. And one of the older people in the church found out we were playing Uno, and they thought, what are you doing? You sinner, you know cards are of the devil. <laughs> Uno? <laughs> well, I know sometimes the devil can come out on me when I lose, but, <laughs> but really? Seriously? You see what I'm saying? But I would never mention it again to that person. I would never invite him over. I would just do that as unto the Lord and to myself. Listen to what he says in verse 15. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, that's why we know he's talking about food here, with thy meat, now walkest thou not lovingly? If you know that you're doing something and I'm not talking about things that are preferences in people's lives, but things that can make them weak in the faith and maybe embold them through your liberty to go to some place they shouldn't go in their faith. If you embold somebody because you have a beer to become a, a drunkard who struggles with alcohol or whatever, you can see the list in your own mind. It says, listen, do you not walk unlovingly toward that person destroy not him with thy meat from whom christ died be others centered let not thy good be evil spoken of for the kingdom of god is not meat it's not drink it's not what day you worship on listen the kingdom of god is righteousness and it's peace and it's joy in the holy spirit you know again i've had People run out from the parking lot in here when we're praying for people in the thing and say, hey, pastor, pastor, you need to get out in the parking lot right now. There are people out there smoking cigarettes. You need to go deal with it. I've had that happen in this church. And I said, well, you go deal with it. Just follow them around and pick up the butts. We don't want them out there in the parking lot. Well, don't you think that's a sin? No, I don't. Let the Holy Spirit work on them. You don't understand, months ago that person was smoking crack. Now they're only smoking cigarettes. God's working in them. God saves them. His grace is on them. His Holy Spirit is in them. He's working through them. Let the Holy Spirit, if, if, if it's wrong to smoke a cigarette, the Holy Spirit will tell them. You ain't the Holy Spirit. Now you can be a servant. Go out and pick up the butts. Well, I don't want to pick up the butts. They're dirty and filthy. Then shut up. Brother, where's your love? Where's your care? I've had people questioning me, say, well, you, you, I believe smoking will keep you out of heaven. You believe that? No. I think it'll get you there sooner, but I don't think it'll keep you out. But I know one day you'll stand before God with your judgmental attitude. You better be careful. Now you can put your arm around that brother and tell him, you know what that does to your body? You know what it does to your skin? You know what it does to your lungs? You know how much it costs? You can buy a new car and make payments on it for how many cigarettes you smoke a day. Reason with them. But don't judge them. Amen? Boy, it's getting quiet. 
Come on, I got a few more minutes. I'll step on your toes some more. Here's what it says. <laughs> Listen carefully. For the kingdom of God is not meat, it's not drink, but it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he that is, for he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherein one may edify another. For meat destroyeth not the work of God. All things indeed are pure in and of themselves, but it is evil for that man to eateth with offense. You can take your liberty, and which is fine before God, it's pure, and you can use it to hurt other people. And you need to be very careful about that is what he's saying. For verse 21 says, It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby your brother is stumbled, or to offend, or to make weak. Set aside your liberty for the benefit of the weaker brother is what Paul is saying. When you do that, you now have the heart of God. You have the heart of Christ because he's set apart. He's going to say that in the text as we get into chapter 15. He was our example. Look what he set aside for you and me. Live others-centered. Live others-centered, not self-centered, is what he's saying. Now watch what he says as he closes out this particular chapter. Hast thou faith? Do you think it's okay to have a beer at the end of the day? He says, if you have faith, not drunkenness, because that's a sin, but if you, if you think it's okay to have a glass of wine with your meal, or if you think it's okay to have a beer at the end of the day, or if you think it's okay to eat a big giant ribeye or smoke a stogie afterwards, hast thou faith? You're not convicted by it. The Bible doesn't call it sin. You're not convicted by it. He says, if you have faith and you're not convicted by those things, have it to thyself before God. Do it in your privacy that you don't stumble somebody else is what he's saying. Amen. Amen. I can't tell you that drinking a beer is sin. I can tell you drunkenness is. But I can tell you my preferences have nothing to do with it. And my prayer is anybody who's a pastor in this church would have nothing to do with it. Because I see how many people are hurt by it. If, if your preference is, is after a meal to sit down and have a cigar on your front porch and you have faith that that's okay and God hasn't convicted you, go for it. But if you know some brother is still convicted that he's smoking cigarettes and he's anguishing before the Lord because the Lord has shared with him that that's wrong for him and you're there inviting him over for dinner and afterwards you go out on the porch, you're stumbling your brother because your brother has been given by the Holy Spirit a conviction that that's wrong for him. And you're emboldening him to do something that's against what the Holy Spirit is doing in his life. If you have faith that you have certain liberties not addressed as sin but those areas of moderation and liberty have faith unto yourself before God happy is he that condemneth not himself in the things which he alloweth man be true to yourself be true to the work of the holy spirit in your heart be true to your conscience don't do anything that violates your conscience even if somebody else is doing it it may not be right for you there are things and i was talking in a prayer room this morning and i'll, and I'll close with the next couple of verses but there were things that we're talking about that listen i can't find them as sin in the bible i just don't like them i feel convicted about them i won't do it but I'm not going to lay that trip on somebody else. And we were talking about tattoos. I'm afraid of needles. I would never get a tattoo. You know, I've seen some of your older people with your tattoos, man. You know, you, you've got an eagle and that looks like a seagull. You know, come, <laughs> come on, run. why do that to yourself? I, I, I'm afraid of needles. 
But listen, I can't find anywhere in the Bible. Oh, yeah, it says in Leviticus, don't cut yourself for the dead or mark your body. I don't think anybody in this church has to have to cut themselves for the dead or mark their body. I don't think they, they entered into some kind of a pagan practice where they worship a pagan god. And, and that's all, that was pagan. None of you are pagan. If you get a tattoo, my question is why spend the money? Of course, you come to my house and I've got paintings on my wall that are very pricey and you say why spend the money put it on your body carry it around everywhere you go you don't have to have it on the wall in your living room big deal <laughs> and so you might be upset with me that i've got a thomas kincaid 3500 hundred dollar painting in my living room dude you could have got 10 tattoos for that see what i'm saying don't judge one another let it go let it go <laughs> love one another for he that loveth knoweth god for God is love. When it comes to sin, don't be a sin sniffer. Don't be a cop, but be a paramedic. When it comes to the peripheral areas, love one another. You know what? I, I see some of you ladies with these cool little tattoos. I like them looking at you. They wouldn't look so good on me, a rose on the neck. I don't think that would work for me. <laughs> Don't think that would work for me. <laughs> Someone might get the wrong impression. They see a rose on my neck, you know. <laughs> Listen, but I'm not going to judge you. Don't judge me. I'm a redneck. I'm going to tell you, I'm a redneck. I'm a redneck. I live in the woods because I like living in the woods. I'm a Levi kind of guy. That's just who I am. Don't judge me for it. If you want to come here in a suit, that's okay. Too bad for you, but I'm going to dress like I dress every day of the week. Let us not judge one another anymore. Amen. Let's finish out this chapter so I don't have to come back and you know, do a whole other backdrop and run up to it. So here's what he says. Listen carefully. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the things that he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eats. If you can't eat that with faith, and some of you, I think, you, you really feel that eating meat is wrong. Don't eat it. You know, some of you think eating vegetables is wrong. Stop it. You need them. You don't, don't go to here and say, oh, you know what? No, no, no. You need to add vegetables with the meat. Now, the vegetarians are right. You need those things. If you want to add meat to it, that's fine. But listen, make sure whatever you are practicing in your Christian life, the Holy Spirit is not convicting you on these peripheral areas. He that doubteth is damned if he eats because he eateth not of faith. For whosoever is not of faith, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Everything you do, listen, we have the manual that tells us on all of the serious areas of our life, what is right and what is wrong. Amen? But there has been room left within this for the peripheral areas. Would you say amen? And in those things that God is not clear about, He allows the Holy Spirit to work in us to form conviction. And like I said, the church I, I went to uh, when I first got saved, if you went to a dance, I don't care if it's ballroom or square dance, you were in sin. And yet there are people in our church that dance. I've had a person years ago come to me and said, hey, is it okay if we dance? We go to this dance. I said, dude, it's okay for you, but it would be sin for me. Well, what do you mean? Have you seen me dance? <laughs> it would be sin for me. It, it would offend you. Um, it would offend you. I got two left feet, man. I, I got no rhythm. I'm a white guy. Can I say that? I got no rhythm. I got nothing, man, when it comes to that. I'm a redneck. I'll leave it to other people, you know, who think they can dance. Like Steve. He, he, can, he can move, man. See, look, at there he goes. <laughs> so I told you. Be careful is what I think the Bible is saying. Listen carefully. On the things that are clear in the Word, let us stand firm, uncompromisingly so. Would you say Amen. On the peripheral areas, let us give room for the Holy Spirit. And if you're going to judge anything, judge this. Don't stumble your brother with your liberties. Lay it aside.
Now, I know I stumble some of you guys on Sunday morning when I worship. I can't help it. But I have scripture for what I do. The Bible says make a joyful noise. And that's what I'm doing. I even had Ben, when he was leading worship one time after service, come to me and he said, hey, man, don't sing so loud, <laughs> bastard. I go, why? He goes, man, you get me off every time. You know, you sing an R sharp and Z flat, and I'm trying to, you know, I'm in a key of D or C up here, and you're in what? I don't know where you're at. And I said, make a joyful noise. Be careful, guys. You know, some think you should drive a Cadillac. I think you're in sin if you don't drive a Toyota. I'm not going to judge you for driving a Cadillac. I don't know if there's any Cadillacs out there in the parking lot. What I'm saying is be careful. Amen. Do you understand what he's saying? Who are you? Who are you? To judge another man's servant. Before the Lord, he stands. And if he falls, he falls before the Lord. But the Lord is able to hold him up and to make him to stand. The Holy Spirit will do that work. Again, we'll close with what Augustine said. I, I think the man, I don't agree with a lot of what Augustine said. I'll be very honest with you, he was one of the early church fathers, but on this statement, I agree wholeheartedly. Augustine said, on the essentials of the faith, on solid biblical doctrine, we better stand in unity uncompromisingly so. Would you say amen? amen? But then he said, but when it comes to the fringe areas, to the non-essentials, then we ought to give liberty. And there's, not a, lot, there's a lot of non-essentials in the church that we need to give liberty to. Let the Holy Spirit work. Amen? But in all things, now I'm going to paraphrase, be a paramedic and not a cop. In all things, show love and charity toward your brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? Amen? Amen. 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 Well, chapter 15, we'll get a few more verses of this, just in case you forget between this week and next week. And, and then, you know, may, may the Lord, may the Lord. You know, Jesus said, by this sign shall all men know that you're my disciples because you have love one to another. Be an encourager. Let your words be seasoned with grace, but let them be salty. Let your words be seasoned with grace, but let them be salty. And let no corrupt c communication come out of your mouth, but only that which builds up and edifies and ministers grace and encouragement to the hearer. Amen? That's the body of Christ. And sometimes one of the most gracious things you do is put your arm around a brother and say, hey, you know, what you're doing is wrong. And you ought not to be doing it. It will hurt you. It will hurt your family. And we confront. We speak the truth. But don't ever just speak the truth unless you can speak it in love. Jeremiah was told by God, don't, you don't have the right to prophesy against any person that you have not wept over. May we love each other to that degree. Amen? Let's stand and have the worship team come. Read ahead. We'll be in chapter 15 next week. Don't forget, no Wednesday night service this week. Uh, I'll see you at the fair with your body armor on. Man, crazy world, is it not? Crazy world, is it not? Continue to pray for those people that are on vacation, that are making their way back. I think after fair week is when our school system starts up again, so playtime is over. And it's time to settle down again in church. Amen. Pray for them. Pray for my wife as she travels home Monday. I don't want anything to happen to her. Man, I'd be a mess. I'm already a mess, but I'd be a real mess without her. Amen? You can say amen. I'd be a mess. Let's pray. Father, there's a lot of section of scripture that, that I think ought to be preached and taught more often than others. And I think this thing of loving one another, 
and not judging one another on the non-essentials of the faith is one of them. Lord, teach us to build up and not tear down. Teach us to love and not criticize. You know, God, I need your heart. Mine's desperately wicked. I need your heart. I need to love like you love. I need to encourage as you've encouraged me. God, I need your heart to be patient and to be kind to others as you've been patient and kind to me. And Lord, as you have allowed your spirit to work in me to form convictions, Lord, help me to allow your spirit to work in others to form convictions. Lord, I'm no man's judge, and I thank you that you don't judge me anymore, but that you've forgiven me. Teach me to forgive others the same way. I pray in Jesus' name. every eye closed, every head bowed just for a moment. I don't normally do this, but I just feel like the Holy Spirit wants to set some people free this morning. If you're here this morning and you have and are struggling with a critical spirit, a judgmental attitude, and if, if you have been, the Holy Spirit has already been working. It's not something you have to think deeply about. Well, do I have one? Do I don't? No, you'll know. If that's you this morning, I want you to be free of that when you leave here. And just like the lady who reached out and touched the hem 
of the master's garment. And immediately that issue of blood was healed. If that's you this morning, would you just reach up? Take a hand and just reach up toward the master's garment. And say, Master, I have a critical spirit. I know it. I feel it. I can be very judgmental, and I shouldn't. I've allowed things to separate me from other people. I'm not talking about sinful behavior. I'm just talking about preferences. And Lord, I'm asking you today to change my heart. I can't change my heart. I can change my mind. I can confess that my heart is wrong. But only you, through the work of your Spirit, can change the heart. So I'm asking you, Father, this morning to free me, to set me free of a judgmental and critical spirit. In fact, Lord, when I see those things that are absolutely wrong in somebody else's life, put such love in my heart for that person so that I can go to them and love and help them. And so, Father, that's what I asked this morning. I ask that you would do it for me in Jesus' name. And all God's kids would say, amen. amen, amen. Hey, if you're in need of prayer this morning, we'll be up here praying with you. Other than that, you are dismissed to fellowship. God bless you guys.